The late 60s and the 1970 model year were a great time in American V8 history. While General Motors certainly had many excellent engines in the stable before these years, 1968 through 1970 saw the rise of some of the largest GM V8s made, the 455s from Buick, Oldsmobile, and Pontiac. These engines found themselves in a wide variety of applications, including everything from performance vehicles to large and heavy luxury cars. And despite the multitude of applications, they served their purpose well in almost every instance in which they were used. And while they all share the same displacement, few people know that the Buick Olds and Pontiac 455s share virtually no parts aside from some ignition and fuel components. Let's learn a little bit more about each of these engines. Oldsmobile division was first to the party with its 455 cubic inch V8 in 1968. The engine was created by lengthening the previous 425 cubic inches stroke from 3.975 inches to 4.25 inches. Both engines shared a 4.126 inch bore. This undersquare design would really help promote the Oldsmobile V8's legacy as a torque producer, but did give it a reputation for running out of breath at higher RPMs as compared to other V8 engines of its day. Nonetheless, the 1968 Oldsmobiles carried a wide range of 455 cubic inch engines, ranging from at the bottom end a 310 horsepower regular fuel, two-barrel powered 455, all the way to the top producing mill, a 400 horsepower 455 found in the Tornado. The full range of 455s from Oldsmobile in 1968 included the previously mentioned 310 horsepower V8, which was standard with manual transmission, the Delta 88s and an optional at extra cost in the Del Monte 88. If you got an automatic transmission, you would get a 320 horsepower version of the same engine, still with a two-barrel carburetor, but now as opposed to a 9 to 1 compression ratio, it had a 10.25 to 1 compression ratio and required premium fuel. One up from the 320 horsepower engine was the 365 horsepower 455. It was found standard in the 98s and available at extra cost in the 88s. The Tornado had two exclusive versions of the 455, a standard 375 horsepower version, and an optional 400 horsepower version that had forced air induction and dual exhaust outlets. Both used premium gas. No 455 was available in Oldsmobile's Performance 442 in 1968. However, by 1970, the 455 had expanded to use into the 442 with a standard 365 horsepower version and an optional 375 horsepower version. The top 400 horsepower 455 was still reserved only for the Tornado with the W34 package in 1970. Oldsmobile's 455 would continue on through the 1976 model year when it was discontinued and the largest Oldsmobile V8 subsequent to that became the 403 cubic inch engine, which was a very over square design, employing the same stroke as Oldsmobile's 350 cubic inch V8 but a much larger bore requiring Siamese cylinders. And unfortunately, along the way to its demise in 1976, the Olds 455 became gradually and increasingly neutered as emissions regulations continued to choke horsepower ratings. The once mighty 455 that was producing up to 400 horsepower in tornadoes in 1968, 69, and 1970 was now producing a max horsepower in Tornados of 215 horsepower and only 190 horsepower in 98s and 88s, a far cry from what it was once able to produce. It is true that the horsepower ratings were based on different standards up until 1972. However, these standards changes do not fully explain the precipitous drop in horsepower and driving an Oldsmobile 455 from the late 60s certainly produces a very different seat of the pants feel from one from the mid 70s, not only due to changes in horsepower output, but also due to the increases in weight of the vehicles in which they found themselves employed. A similarly unfortunate fate would also be realized by the Buick and Pontiac 455s along their way to demise in 1976 as well. Let's turn now to the Buick 455 cubic inch engine. While Oldsmobile had introduced its 455 early to the party in 1968, 
Buick took a few additional years to introduce its 455, continuing with its 430 cubic inch engine that was introduced in 1967, in 1968, and 1969 before coming out with its 455 in 1970. While Oldsmobile had taken the approach of lengthening the stroke of its previous 425 cubic inch engine, Buick did the exact opposite, boring out its 430 cubic inch engine and keeping the stroke the same at 3.9 inches. Thus, the Buick 455 was an oversquare design with a bore of 4.31 inches and a stroke of 3.9 inches. Endowing it with some higher revving characteristics than the Oldsmobile V8. Buick also jumped headfirst into placing the 455 in everything from luxury cars like the Electra to personal luxury coupes like the Riviera to its sport models, the GS 455 in 1970, the 455's first year. There were also fewer horsepower variants of Buick's 455 in its introductory model year, and no matter which car you got it in on the luxury side, whether that was a Riviera, an Electra, a Wildcat, or even optional in the Sabre, the 455 made 370 horsepower and 510 pound-feet of torque. Thus, unlike the Tornado, the Riviera got the same horsepower engine as the big luxury cars, albeit with one distinct difference, and that is what I believe one of the first applications of an electric fuel pump in a GM vehicle. The 1970 Riviera was one of the few cars for General Motors that used one of these electric fuel pumps along with a carbureted engine. The Chevrolet Vega was another application, although we'll save that discussion for another day. In the GS models, the 455 was rated at 350 horsepower standard, and the optional Stage 1 GS 455 was rated at just 10 horsepower more, 360 horsepower. It's quite possible that this 360 horsepower Stage 1 was underrated from the factory, to say the least, perhaps so that its customers could save on their insurance bills. Overall, 1970 would represent the only model year in which the Buick 455 would be required to use premium gas. As in 1971, an edict by then General Motors President Ed Cole required that all engines, including performance engines, be able to operate on no lead fuel. Thus, the 1970 model year represented a very brief peak in Buick 455 horsepower, which would not yet be achieved again in between 1970 and its eventual demise in 1976. In fact, by 1976, and similar to the Oldsmobile V8, the Buick 455 was producing just 205 net horsepower, a shadow of its former self. It wouldn't be many years after 1976 that the Buick V8 was shelved altogether, albeit it did soldier on in 350 cubic inch form for a number of years, and in a number of applications beyond the Buick portfolio before being eventually discontinued. However, over the course of its run, the Buick 455 gained a reputation as a smooth and reliable performer, albeit, unfortunately, its oversquare design was not able to be put to good high-performance use in the later years where it was choked down by emissions. Let's turn now to the final 455 engine in the General Motors stable, the Pontiac 455, also introduced in 1970. 1970 was a very strange year for Pontiac and indeed hit in the middle of a tumultuous period for the division when it had five different general managers subsequent to John DeLorean's departure between 1968 and 1980. It was also during this time that Pontiac stylists explored some, shall we say, interesting and unique themes including nothing more unique than arguably the 1970 full-size Pontiacs. With their, shall we say, toothsome grill that mimicked a bit of the flair from the 1969 Grand Prix, 1970 Pontiacs were, well, let's say an acquired taste. However, under hood, a new treat came in the form of the 455 cubic inch engine, which was an enlarged version of Pontiac's 428 engine from the previous year. Whereas the Pontiac 428 was an oversquare design with a bore of 4.12 inches and a stroke of 4 inches, the 455 was an undersquare design created by expanding both the bore and stroke of the 428, 
the 455 having a bore of 4.15 inches and a stroke of 4.21 inches, thus being slightly under square. Similar to Buick, Pontiac included 455 as standard equipment or an option really across many different types of cars, including luxury vehicles like the Bonneville, where it made a standard 360 horsepower, or even in the GTO of the era, where it made a similar 360 horsepower. There was a high-output 455 available across numerous vehicles, including the Grand Prix, that made up to 370 horsepower. And just like Buick, 1970 was the pinnacle of performance for the Pontiac 455, and the only year it could be found in high compression form. For just like its siblings, by 1976, the Pontiac 455 had lost a lot of its previous horsepower. It was down to about 200 horsepower in its final year. It's also, to my knowledge, the only large displacement GM engine that employs somewhat blocked off secondary throttle plates in 1976, which precludes some higher horsepower ratings. The Pontiac 455 is generally regarded as a great engine, but aside from the SD 455 that came out in the 70s, it generally doesn't have as many high-performance components as the 421 from the 60s, which had a forged crankshaft and forged connecting rods. Outside of the SD 455, Pontiac's 455 engines did not get these components. Stay tuned for a separate video on the SD 455. So when it comes to evaluating these 455 engines from Buick, Olds, and Pontiac, which one is best? Which one is reliable? Which one has challenges? Well, to be honest, they're all excellent engines, and it's hard to pick one. And frankly, I'll save my favorite for another video. But I will say that when you have a chance to drive them, I found, particularly in 1970, guys, the Buick 455 is the rever of the bunch. In fact, my 1970 Electra seems noticeably faster from about 50 to 90 miles an hour than it does getting off the line as the engine pulls very strongly all the way to its rev line. The Oles feels a bit more like a Weezer at the top end of its RPM range, but has significant amounts of torque and gets you off the line very smartly. And it also does have some good power in the early years. The Pontiac's a bit of a mix of both, as you would expect, from its near even square design, if you will. I will also say that from my experience, the Pontiac V8 is the one that responds best to putting dual exhausts on it, likely because the Y pipes are quite restrictive as both cylinder heads squeeze down into half moon shapes before going out into a single exhaust. I'll also say that in my experience, the Oles 455 tends to be the most reliable of the bunch. Some of the Pontiacs had timing chain issues as well as valve or lifter or camshaft issues. And the Buicks have a really not-so-fun water pump to replace where you have to remove relatively small bolts that go through a timing cover. They also can have oil pump issues. The Oles V8 really doesn't have these and seems to be the most robust, although I'm sure that some folks have had issues with them as well. However, I will say that all three engines are very reliable, smooth, durable, and, in my mind, excellent. You really can't go wrong by having a vehicle with any of these engines under hood. And the best solution, which I've certainly employed, is to at least get one of each. Until next time, thanks again for watching this video, and take care. Thanks again for watching this video providing an overview of the Buick, Oles, and Pontiac 455 engines. If you liked it, please be sure to like and comment as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve this video up to more people like you. And until next time, check out some video thumbnails at the bottom left and right as suggestions for you. And if you're not yet subscribed, click the circular icon at the top left of the 67 Buick Riviera, then hit the bell to ensure you're notified of all my future videos. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, take care.